Looks like we got two bros. Hey. Hey. Two bros. Guys. There we go. All right. What's Let's going on? The mic. Let's see. This is going to be our shot. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right, cool. So I think this is it. Is all this technology working good? God, you look sexy. That's what I thought you would say. <laughs> oh, shit. And it probes. And it probes. Sexual harassment, guys. Yeah, right off the bat. <laughs> On a college campus. He does campus. look thin, though, right? He looks check, check. really thin and fit. He's not supposed to look thin and fit when he has babies. <laughs> I got my baby body, my body back after the babies. This is... <laughs> um, nice. All right, guys, so... Uh, we're just gonna get this mic thing together. Right now, we're um, we're shooting a, a simulcast as well, um, and recording it. So uh, it's kind of a this is kind of a big deal as part of our uh, film festival. So really, thank you guys for coming and giving us your time. We appreciate it. all these or a lot of these people are film students, um, so this is gonna be really educational for them um, and me as well. Cool. I'll use this. Cool. Okay. Does that help or hurt? Or background where there's check, check. cars in it, so you guys would think I'm cool, like a musician. Yeah. <laughs> How long did you work on your backup for? They don't. They're all cardboard. <laughs> all day. Props team. All right. Very good. You ready for the introductions? Yeah. All right. First, we have giving our introductions is Larissa, who's one of our uh, graduate students. Please. Hello. Bring us some sunshine, will you? All right. Thank you guys for coming. In case you don't know, can you hear me? Yeah. I feel like I can't hear myself. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? Yeah! Woo! All righty. I... Yeah. Don't, don't, don't make a big deal out of it. <laughs> no pressure. Make a bigger deal. Um, let me turn to make sure I point to the right one here. Okay. Dre's on the left. Yeah, I know. I... Okay. So, on one half... We have standing five foot 11, 158 IMDb credits. <laughs> Winner of Best Screenplay Award for a Puffy Chair at the 2005 Bend Film Festival. America's most loved Sagittarius, Mr. Mark Duplass. Yeah! And on the other side, standing an astonishing five foot nine inches. <laughs> With 132 <laughs> IMDb credits, nominated for a 2015 Critics' Choice Award for his role in Transparent, America's Most Handsome Pisces, Mr. J. Duplass. <laughs> and Sacred Heart's favorite new professor, Mr. Todd Barnes. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Larissa. All right, um, let me see if I really do my folder. I lost my folder. You're fired. Guys, we haven't seen this movie in like 12 years. Is it any good? I, I, I literally have no idea. Yeah, I was gonna, I, I'm probably going to ask you some specific questions about it, but I was thinking the same thing because I saw it so many years ago, um, and it was just a real treat to watch again, honestly. Uh, there's lots of stories that I kind of remember about it, so I might be able to um, pitch you guys a little bit. But one of the things that was great for us watching it um, as students is these guys are going out and making their own stuff now. And a lot of the stuff we preach to them is use the stuff you have or, you know, if you've got friends. So if you guys could talk, if you remember at all, about what you had at the beginning of this project, what you were hoping to make, who you brought onto it, where you traveled, how often you shot, any of that stuff um, that might help these guys see that they can pull off the same kind of thing. Yeah. I don't like to remember that stuff more than the other stuff. Yeah. We had a van. <laughs> we had a van and three people in, in an apartment in a small town, and that's why that's what's in the movie. Those are the only things we had. We there was some there was some like there was some architecture to it. We didn't really know what we were doing. Um, we kind of stumbled into it based upon what we've now uh, call our, our the available material school of filmmaking. Um, and that's really what Jay was talking to. I was I was a musician. You guys see all those guitars behind me? <laughs> Authentic. And uh, and I had that van, and so we said, okay, that could be a picture car, but we could also travel our entire cast and crew, which was going to be eight people, and then the last two rows of the van will take out, and that'll be the cargo space. So it'll be our grip truck, 
So that felt really good. We were getting three for one there. I and mean, we shot in my apartment and, and my wife Katie's apartment, who's in the movie. And and her her dad um, is like the small town black bag doctor in Maine where we shot. Um, and like everybody likes him and could give us favors. So that's where we like, you know, lit a chair on fire in a parking lot and everybody was fine with it. You know? uh, and no fire marshal and no... Fire extinguisher. Unbelievable. We have a, we think we have a fire extinguisher. Just, yeah. but not for safety reasons, just so we could get more takes out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember and how many times you've been? The of the movie was, swear to God, to, to make a feature film that didn't suck. And our, our, to be clear, our thinking was, at that point we had made two short films that had, that had been in Sundance. One cost $3, one cost $100. They were very, needless to say, lo-fi, had one or two actors in them. And we thought, we can make eight minutes work, so let's make a movie that's like ten eight-minute scenes. So like that will be have a less chance of it uh, blowing up in our faces. And, and then that accidentally kind of uh, brought a good form, because not only could you make that cheaply, but, you know, we, we realize now when we still make cheap movies um, that, like, Doing less scenes and long scenes is very conducive to good uh, independent filmmaking because, as you probably know, for those of you who are film students, the time it takes you to shoot a two-minute scene versus a ten-minute scene is just the eight extra minutes per take. Everything else is the same with the setup and everything. Um, so, you know, we're still making movies this, to this day, like this movie Blue Jay that we produced – um, you know, we shot in seven days and everybody's like, oh my God, how'd you shoot a movie in seven days? And we're like, well, it was, it's like 14, seven minute scenes and we shot two scenes a day and it was actually ridiculously comfortable. So the DNA of the puppy chair, as crazy as it sounds, most of the independent film stories are, God, we should have shot this movie in 36 days. We did it in 15. We only had time for one take. I find that to be not good architecture for an independent film. Our, our theory is build a movie that should only take three days to shoot, then shoot it in six days, and you're living in the lap of luxury, and it feels like an actual large-budget film. And, and the puppy chair kind of had some of that. Nice. Uh, we, one of the things I noticed, which I forgot about the film, um, and speaking of available materials, is your dad at the end, Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that decision? Because he's just really great in it. And now, I, I, as soon as he comes out, I'm like, oh, my God, he looks like Jay. And he's got Mark's eyes and all that kind of stuff. So um, talk about using your family and, and stuff like he that. He was 50, 58 then, and he looks younger than both of us do now. And that's, yeah, that's just sad. Was he 58 uh, then? No uh, way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, this is going to be a whole moment, you guys. Think. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, yeah, so not only did he have to pay $15,000 for us to make the movie because we didn't have any money, but he had to be in it. But um, it was um, that story that he tells is the, is the story of how he met and married my mom, um, our mom, and, and it was always totally ridiculous to us and... I don't think he was aware of how insane that story sounded. <laughs> but he was just so game to just come and do it. Um, we did not prep them at all. They basically just had to answer the door. <laughs> and then we uh, sat that down and we're like, tell Mark the story. And, and I think it was, but it was, it was like it had been rehearsed over the years, you know? Right. Yeah. Uh, and I can't tell you how many people have come up to us and said, man, that was like really good advice that your dad gave. And I like kind of when it, as soon as I heard that, I knew like something inside of me died because I knew the person I was with wasn't the right person. <laughs> oh responsible for quite a few breakups. Oh, maybe. yeah. We caused so many breakups in the late aughts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> people called us thanking us and people would email us um, hating yeah. on us for what we did to couples. <laughs> To, to the, I guess, to the logistical question of that, Todd, there's something, I think you're right in the available materials where, you know, I had never, Katie and Jay and I had never really produced a movie before. We, we, we should have, in our brains, hired a professional producer to do it. 
But what we did was we, we just did it ourselves. We made up the system. We were dedicated to the movie and smart enough to kind of get it done. And what we lacked in experience, we made up for and just love of the project. Same thing with our dad. He's not really a good actor, but you know, he loved us. He, we knew that story really well. We didn't try to push him too far out of his comfort zone. It was something we knew we could get on screen that would feel genuine. Um, so we're always kind of preaching that as much as you can. Like we feel like now it's been, I don't know, you know, 13 years since we made that movie and we've developed filmmaking skills so that we don't have to tell things that aren't extremely autobiographical or directly ripped from our lives. But back then, when we were fumbling around, it was nice to be able to grab things and people that were kind of ready to go. And and it was like an easy way to know that it was true and real because you don't really know what you're doing when you're starting filmmaking. There's so many elements to filmmaking. That, you know, it's like 150 things have to come together and you don't know re really which ones are the most important. So like Mark and I had failed so much in filmmaking that we were just like, just shoot something that's real. Shoot one thing that's real. Um, and, and, you know, with our short films, they were so small and so relatable and directly from our lives. And people seemed to love them and care. So we were just like obsessive about achieving just honest moments on screen. And, and you know, it was definitely at a time when, I don't know, the style was such... It was coming out of like Tarantino land at that point in time. So it was very unusual to actually have things on screen that felt so real that you didn't even know if they were real or not. Um, or but it's interesting. Yeah. What's that? Or at least off the cuff and kind of. Off the cuff, yeah. I mean, but it's interesting the way you were talking about the way that we directed Dad is like a lot of. I mean, it's, it's interesting because it definitely works with non actors, but it's kind of how we direct super famous actors too it's just like our approach is essentially to disobligate them from trying to be anything exceptional uh you know it's more just like let them do their thing um encourage them to just be real i mean a lot of times we'll go up to actors and just say like it's not your job to be entertaining or to do anything you know you know what the script is just do the moment as honestly as you can and the rest is essentially up to us and we found that um, the more that you, I mean, obviously this works well for our style of filmmaking, um, but the more that, that we do that, the better the performances get and the more natural they are. And, and when the, even if you have like big emotional moments to achieve, when you get to them, they're, they're, they're going to come from a real place. Nice. Actually, I was, um, you know, speaking of not seeing this in a long time, uh, watching it again tonight, I was having th thoughts that kind of dovetail with what you guys were talking about, one of which is, you know, at the time, uh, we knew you guys, but knew you guys as other filmmakers and just really nice guys that we were friends with. So I remember seeing an early cut of this, and the crucial part of the movie, you know, for me, of uh, the action is where Mark's character uh, really sort of takes control. He, he runs into the furniture guy, has trouble, then he goes and he does the honking, and he's never going to leave. Um, so at the time that was made, I remember watching that and thinking, oh, man, you know, I don't know if it's got to be that strong or that tough. Now, you know, 15 years later, looking back at full careers and you saying like it, it, it seemed it seemed to me inauthentic at the time. Now, looking back, I realized that it was more authentic than the way we knew you guys. And in fact, I've seen the way you guys run your career. Um, I talk it as a take no guff kind of attitude. Um, and I think that's how you guys navigated Hollywood and sort of going through all these different things. Can you talk a little bit about maybe the attitude that Josh shows there, which actually is part of your real life, which you actually have been using for 15 years? Yeah, I mean, we really ended up in a very different place in our careers than we thought, you know. Um, and I think that once we got into Sundance with the puppy chair, we realized, okay, we're on the road to a certain degree, right? And the road back then looked like let's go to make movies at Fox Searchlight. Those five to $10 million movies that sometimes get nominated for awards. And, and that's what we thought we were gonna be. And that's where we made this movie Cyrus and a similar world where we made Jeff Who Lives at Home. And um, the, the long and the short of those experiences were we're very proud of those movies and we actually got to make the movies we wanted to make, but it almost killed us. 
the amount of conversations, the amount of um, just over management on the part of the executives, which is even worse now because those movies are making less money. They're more scared they're going to lose money. So they're all over you, you know. And, and I look back now at Cyrus and I'm like, I can't believe we spent $7 million making that movie. It was all salaries. That movie we could have made for $500,000. It, it, it's crazy, you know. And, and what was very interesting to us is that, you know, we realized that if, if we were going to stay here, we were going to have to change as people. Uh, we were going to have to be so tenacious, so, like, you can't – we thought we were doing the right thing by being in development meetings because we've been to therapy by validating their opinion, being thoughtful, being sweet, all the things that keep your marriages and your friendships alive. And they essentially didn't respect us and thought we didn't have vision. And one night I lost my temper and was like worse than Josh. And they like made us sit in a van with them after like a 13 hour shoot day to discuss reshooting the first scene of Cyrus because it wasn't pretty enough and they wanted more throw pillows in there and and I, I just like lost my shit and and then they were kind of like oh well oh, these guys are auteurs they have vision you know <laughs> like well this is awful I mean this is just fucking terrible you know um so there is a tenacity that you're talking about for sure to how we want to do things and, and what that has meant is is I think good news for people like you, if you're filmmakers, which is we made the puffy chair so we could get the searchlight. And then we turned right back around and went back to the puffy chair and realized that that is not just a stepping stone to get someplace, but but a, an, an industry and a ecosystem in and of itself. You know, and when we make movies, the perfectly designed movie for us now is something that we make for a few hundred thousand dollars and, and put our close peers in it who, you know, ideally are actors who have some value to it. And we understand that element of the business and that few hundred thousand dollar movie is worth a couple of million dollars and we make enough money to do our thing and we own it. And, and that is really like where we want to be. So we're actually, I think to your point, ruthless about, um, staying close to that and, 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 and doing what we do well. And, Every now and then somebody will call and they'll be like, do you want to direct this big movie? And we think about it. And every time we look at each other, we're just like, man, we're just better off in the puffy world. Yeah, right. I mean, like, you know, Brad and I have had, I remember having these discussions early on by going, geez, Josh and or J Mark and Jay are going to really get in trouble with this kind of attitude. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's just something like looking back and now looking at the puffy chair as just an anatomy of, how do you go after your thing and, and don't let other people sort of push you around if they have their own visions is really inspiring and really kind of a cool thing for everybody to see. Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, Room 104 a little bit. Um, uh, if, if for those of you guys, I don't know if you've seen it, Room 104 it was an HBO show. They had uh, 12 episodes last year with all different directors. You guys didn't direct any of them. Um, and I know you guys have always been trying to bring up your friends and find voices that weren't being heard before. Can you talk a little bit about that idea with this show and, and, and what it means for new voices coming up? Yeah, I mean, Room 104 was kind of an eye opener for us. And, and, you know, part of this is like we're dads and we want to spend some more time with our kids. And so we're trying to find ways to like collaborate with other people and keep things fresh, but also have some time in our lives. So we're not just like working 16 hours a day. So that was a big part of it. But, you know, what we realized with this show is that, um, again, as Puppy Chair was designed to be made cheaply, it's the same ethic, you know. We're, on, we're in a 400-square-foot box, um, so the show is incredibly cheap to make. Because of that, you know, we don't ask HBO for a lot of money, and, and, and we get to own the show, um, and they license it from us, which is a little bit of that sort of business model again, but I, I really believe in understanding your business so that it can feed your creativity. And, and so what that essentially means is we have full creative control over the show. And um, Jay and I designed it so that, you know, look, you know, we'll write a bunch of the episodes and create a bunch of the stories, but then pass them on to like 28 year old filmmakers out of Sundance or, you know, you know, representation is a big issue right now. I think that's kind of part of what the show allows us to do in front of and behind the camera. It's like 
over half the shows are directed by women. And I think that's important to do. Um, and, um, what we've also realized, which is great is that while Jay and I are probably more experienced than the average director who comes on that show, the young directors that we give that chance to prepare more than us are more excited to do it than we are. And they most of the time do as good, if not a better job because of that. Um, and we get this new kind of energy around it that we wouldn't have thought of. And so we've stamped it with our writing and with our producing, you know, and, and then we get this new extra collaboration out of it. And that's really been really exciting for something we're looking to do more of. Nice. Can you, uh, can Jay, can you talk a little bit about you're in an episode as an actor there called I Knew You Were Dead, which I thought was a really sort of raw and emotional performance. Um, so just from a performance side, can you talk a little bit about how you get there, how you work with the director, how you prepare? Sure. Um, well, it's just like a really new and unusual experience. Um, I don't know. It was like... Um, the the episode was written by Mark for me that was based on just a piece that I had written at some point in time, a prose piece that I had written about an experience that I had had with an old friend. And so Mark wrote the episode for me, and I brought So Young Kim, who's this incredible director, who, I mean, she's not an up-and-coming director. I mean, she's directed like three killer movies that have been at Sundance. And um, she had directed me in Transparent, and I knew I worked with her really well, so we brought her in to direct it. And, you know, um, it was a really personal story. I didn't have to prepare for it that much. I was emotionally in the right place. But it was like 30 pages of dialogue, which is one of the things about Room 104 that it, it, it's, it's like a, it's almost, it's almost a, a stage play. Um, so that was that was different and new. Like I really had to like know my lines. I mean, it's so boring, but yeah, that was about it. It was just like learning my lines, like to a T. So I didn't slow anybody down, you know? Um, and that's a big, that makes a big difference. Yeah. 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 Yeah, It was like, um, a pretty, pretty intense schedule. Um, yeah, I was like doing a play one time basically is almost what it felt like, like rehearsing it and putting it on all in like two and a half days. Um, but it was, you know, it was an incredible experience, and I got to play a role that I, you know, was new to me and exciting to me. And I don't know, I was just um, never dreamed in a million years. I mean, I just only recently started acting a few years ago. I never dreamed I'd be like doing a one-off in an HBO show that we—that's our show. I mean, it's just so surreal to me. But it, like Mark said, it really does all come from this place of homemade art you know like you guys like we come from a place probably even more than you guys you guys went to nyu i mean we just you know we made home movies and we we did happen to be in austin at the sort of birth of diy filmmaking you know but we've always just made things with our hands and made things the way that we feel comfortable set up situations that make us feel comfortable you know and i mean one thing i I do want to add to the conversation that we we're having before, because I think it's really important for students, is like another thing that made Cyrus really hard for us was that the most expensive movie we made before Cyrus was a hundred thousand dollar movie that we paid for and brought to Sundance to sell. And Cyrus was a seven million dollar movie with John C. Riley and Jonah Hill and Marissa Tomei and Catherine Keener. And we made a pretty astronomical leap it didn't feel astronomical because a lot of people were making those leaps but in retrospect we went and talked to a lot of the people who were making those leaps and everyone got their asses handed to them and you know the one thing that we you know it's a, it's almost like a universal thing that film students want to just get paid to make a feature and and do it in the studio system but the truth is is that if you make a leap that's too big you're you're gonna you're gonna suffer for it like you 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 know like we have friends who have like you know made a million dollar movie went Sundance and then they make a 25 million dollar movie and usually what happens is they were hired because they can be bullied and controlled because they don't really have any clout to say fuck you I'm doing this no it's 25 million dollars you're a whippersnapper you don't deserve 25 million dollar movie and, and there's a reason why you've been put in that position 
I mean, the truth is right now, Mark and I could direct a $10 million movie, no problem, and have full control and basically just tell the studio, hey, fuck off if you're not going to do this because we've sort of earned our right into that position. But we still don't want to do it because even even without the battles, it's it's so many um, conversations, so much explaining, you know? And we've just found that, like, to expand on what Mark is saying is, like, for us, talking about making a movie repeatedly uh, expends the creative energy that goes into making the movie. Um, it's, a, it's, you know, it's not like a one-to-one relationship, but it's a really interesting concept because, you know, we grew up just sort of figuring the movie out as it's happening. And a lot of people think that that's an amateur way to do things, but there's an electricity to it and there's a there is like the puppy chair you just saw it it looks like crap i shot it on our home video camera and i was using a servo zoom back and forth it's horrible (laughs) but like part of it is also that you know that what is happening in front of the camera is real you just subconsciously kind of know it because it is real and like i think the human perceptive system is aware of those things you know so and to that point i think what's also important is that's what you have in your hand as a student is like you can't make uh, a Terrence Malick movie, but you can make the puffy chair. So um, since one is practical and one isn't, just go towards the one that is <laughs> yeah. very, very important, you know. And I think that that whole thing that Jay is talking about, talking a movie to death and then it's three years later and it's time to make your movie and you're a different person and you don't like it anymore because you have actually fallen out of love with it. When we make our movies now, it is a little crazy, but again, I, I, I bring up this movie, Blue Jay, on Netflix. I came up with the idea. We were shooting in six weeks from the moment I came up with the idea. We were f- in love with the movie while we were making it um, and and discovering it. And there are little errors that happen because of that, but I think the overwhelming positivity is that you feel that energy and you feel that like momentum and and. And again, can't stress enough that like when you're doing it on that micro budgeted scale, like well, nobody can stop you from that. Yeah, and the Stones have some misplayed chords on some of their albums too, so you guys should be fine. <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, one more we're, question from yeah, go ahead. Let's let's call it. Yeah, we're the Rolling Stones. Yeah, exactly. It's the same. <laughs> it's the same thing of film. Um, I have one more question, then I want to open it up to uh, people in the audience. So I'll run out there. Um, but speaking in terms of uh, you know, you guys saying use what you've got available and, and make these kind of smaller leaps. Um, I'm working with a bunch of these students now um, in a class called commercial production, and I'm trying to get them to go out there and meet some people and kind of hang a shingle and make some ads for people. And there's a lot more of that need now, even in the hinterlands of Connecticut. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about, and I've just read about this, but Donut, uh, what made you guys get into that space? If you see uh, space for, you know, young independent people for getting in that too. It's all about the Benjamins, y'all. You know, <laughs> um, we, you know, we we kind of did this model of independent film. You make it cheaply, you sell it. It's great. We brought it to TV with Animals and with Room 104. And we said, oh, we'll make these cheaply and sell them later. And we, someone approached us through the years. They, we've been approached about making commercials. And we're like, we don't need to make commercials. And these guys from Australia approached us uh, two years ago and were like, will you make this for us for this amount of money? And we're like, we don't want to have to like be around everybody and all that have people. Will you give us talk to people? (laughs) We have to have conversations. (laughs) We told them literally give us a third of the budget and don't come and we'll send it to you. And they were like, great. And so did. And we made it for about 2% of the overall budget. And we made them a bunch of them too. A bunch of we gave them a bunch of options. Yeah, and basically they're back there saying, "Man, we ripped off those Duplass brothers and we're here to <laughs> off those guys." And everybody's happy. So that is essentially, you know, what's going on in Donut now is like the ad world is actually not super savvy just yet about how cheaply these things can be made, and they're also a lot more open to things beyond the 30 second commercial that has to be entertaining to get seen because people will just DVR through it. So, you know, speaking candidly, honestly, like 
we're going to do a lot of like small little series for like Snapchat and we'll do things that are, are, you know, one to two minute spots for fun companies that are open to what we want to do. The primary passion of our life is going to be in the other stuff we do, but this is like, um, a real good opportunity to kind of fund our company because we've, we've kind of grown ourselves and we have like 10 employees now and we're really trying to do more stuff. Nice. Okay, so I think we'll open it to the audience. First, before I go to that, I want to make an announcement to you guys that Brad had his first daughter this morning at 1 a.m. Oh, <laughs> named, named Evelyn. They live in Los Angeles, California, near you guys, so I'll have more details to follow. Six, point, oh my God. six pounds, nine ounces. Very healthy, very happy. <laughs> All right, uh, anyone questions first? Okay, I'll come out to the audience like Donahue. Hi. What was your um, script writing process? Was it uh, more improvised? How, did you have outlines for each scene? Um, or was it mostly just dialogue that you wrote? Or was it just mostly outline? Um, we write scripts. We, for the, we particularly? For the puffy chair? Puffy for the chair? puffy chair. Puffy yeah. chair first, and then maybe additional. Um, Mark wrote the first draft. We talked about it a bunch. I think I wrote a draft, and I think you finished it, Mark. I mean, it was like three drafts. Um, yeah, with the understanding that it would be improvised, so we didn't fuss over dialogue, and we didn't fuss over making the screen direction poetic or beautiful or salesworthy because we knew it was for our eyes only. So that gave us permission to move very quickly. Um, I, in the writing of it, what I did was Jay and I came up with the whole scene structure of the movie. And I would write the name of the scene on the front of a note card, flip it over, and like one to two sentences describing it. And that stack of cards was the movie. And then I would speak it into a dictaphone, like, you know, interior apartment, night. You know, he's chewing on the chicken leg and they're singing the song, whatever. Um, and so that uh, that nonlinear, or, or sorry, that linear process of, of doing it on an analog tape and not reading my computer screen and judging myself by how terrible what I had written looked like was very healthy to, to vomit through the draft quickly. Um, and we still do some similar things to that to this day, um, but it was very helpful in the early phase. Um, but the key ingredient of this script, I would say, was allowing ourselves to move fast and know that if it was structurally solid, if the conflicts were good, lame screen direction, a little bit of hackneyed dialogue, it's okay. We'll improvise it on set. We'll spend the time to nuance it and figure it out. And and that didn't get us stuck. It allowed us to keep pummeling forward. And then, you know, for Cyrus, we wrote a very detailed script. Had to be approved by the studio. That that had that whole polishing thing. When we've written, obviously, for studios for hire, we do that. But then Blue Jay or, you know, uh, even this movie, the one I love that we produced, which is like, has like green screens and everything, you know. Those were just outlines, and um, and no no dialogue was was written, and all that was improvised. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the most uh, specific and unique thing about the way we write, whether we write together or what, or sometimes when we write stuff individually. Now, I think we both still do this, like religiously, um, is that we create a full outline to the point where we know our whole story. We know that it, it's full and that it works and that the conflicts are correct and that the setups are paying off and that the plot lines are working and the character arcs are working. I mean, we might not be that anal about teasing those things out, but you know, I think it evolves from the way that Mark and I grew up you know, telling each other stories, basically. It's like an oral storytelling tradition and that that I think is like um, probably our biggest asset as writers. Like um, I'm like the fastest writer that any of my friends know, and Mark is twice as fast as me. <laughs> um, but like we, it's because when we decide to write, it's because probably I've I've like gotten a whole outline and I've told the story to Mark. And he's been nodding pretty much the whole time. And I know that it works. And honestly, then the script, um, I mean, for me, probably takes like 12 days for Mark. It's probably, it can be six days for Mark. 
he's just super fast. I mean, but even 12 days is like nothing compared to what me, most people deal with. And I mean, we just find that like, we have so many friends that swim in that sea of writing and rewriting and destroying yourself, you know? Uh, um, and it's really a hard place to be. And it's, um, I mean, the, the converse of that is that Mark and I live in stories for years and years and years. Like if we work up a feature, but we can't figure out the third act, we don't force it. We just like leave it there. And then maybe like we're in an airport like three years later and Mark's like, remember that story you were talking about? What if this happened in the third act? And I'm like, thank you. Have a movie. Um, <laughs> you know? I mean, but it, I think it's like, um, again, uh, somewhat a part of our like, um, like ruthless efficiency about how we go about, I guess, managing ourselves. And, you know, it's also part of the way of like, I mean, we're really wily about not getting uh, mired yeah. in and getting stuck because it, it's a real thing. Like, it's very easy to get stuck and to question yourself and to, like, feel like a piece of shit every day. Writing is like an exercise in feeling like a piece of shit, I think, <laughs> you know? Um, but, it, yeah, right? I mean, it's <laughs> fucking horrible. It's a nightmare. Um, <laughs> it's nice but, roadblock that you have an, either another project or somewhere else to go and move around you know and that way you don't have to sit there so yeah exactly the best thing you can do is like start writing a script and then find another script to have to cheat on you have an affair <laughs> on the first script with the other script and you have a torrid affair and you write it seven days and that's the movie you should be making yes. that's crazy 14 days is my record so both of you guys are fast thank you Super fast. all right Matt Watch this. Watch this. Stand up, please. Stand up. Sure, yeah. stand up. Hey, guys. Uh, I just wanted to uh, let you guys know, uh, get a little sappy introduction out of the way, but uh, I really wanted to thank you guys for the content you guys have created. When I was an architecture student in undergrad, watching Puffy Chair inspired me to go out and make my own film. So thanks a lot for that. Nice. Um, and uh, then I have a question. I uh, hope that's a good thing. <laughs> it is a good thing. Um, I have a question. I have struck up a uh, working relationship with another one of my students here, and we work very closely together on certain films. Um, so I want to know what you guys find the strengths and the weaknesses of having a really close co-directing partnership are, and what you guys have learned from it. Yeah, um, it's a it's a complex question. We just wrote a 300-page book about it, and it's um, <laughs> we didn't even scratch the surface in the book. <laughs> So, um, you know, I mean, the, 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 the shortest thing I can, I can come across is, uh, is just to say that um, Jay and I got beat down for many years trying to make uh, a decent movie, and it was very, very difficult, and we failed for so long. So that instilled in us an inherent humility that um, we just aren't going to be able to do this by ourselves. Um, and, and being able to sort of collaborate closely together like that has made, has made all the difference when we were discovering what our voice was and, and who, who we could be. And, and, and once we got on our feet, we we're now able to do other partnerships and collaborate with other people. Um, but, you know, I think there's maybe like eight or nine filmmakers out there who can like see a whole movie in their head and go ahead and execute it. And, Two of them are the Coen brothers, and fuck those guys. You know? <laughs> um, and the rest of us are just like trying to figure out. And the more experience we get, the more we realize we need more and more help to get stuff good. You know, so Room 104 episodes, get with the director, write a script, put it up, edit it. And then in our office, we have a dedicated screening room with like 25 fold out chairs and a screen and two to three nights a week, we're throwing up stuff that we've made for people to watch and tell us what do we miss? What do we get wrong? And, and that acceptance uh, that we don't know best and we can't possibly expect ourselves to know best and that our friends will elevate us has made all the difference in our career. Now our, now our new goal is, can we inch a project to within 80% of its final life and then give it to our friends and they'll tell us what to do from there. So the collaboration is everything for us. 
Oh, and before I give up the mic, uh, Mark, is there any... You don't get two questions. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm um, kidding. Is there any uh, reason for me to hope in a volcano I'm still excited reunion? Or is that off the I, um, this hear. whole band I played in that he's talking about that none of you will have ever heard of. <laughs> I have nightmares once every six months about showing up on stage in the tight dickies pants I used to wear in that band, and I can't remember any of the songs. So I don't think that's happening. All right, fair, so. fair enough. Okay. Any more questions? That would be very not efficient for you yeah. to have to relearn a bunch of songs so yeah. 40 people could see you play again. <laughs> not yeah, I, also, you, you, have those, you have those guitars behind you if you just want to pull it down. We've got nothing but time. Yeah. Well, let me ask that. Uh, I guess some... Uh... All right, we're, we're one from the audience here. Are you guys good for time? We're, we've got you for 45 so far, so we're kind of leaking past what we thought. All right. Hi. Hello. Uh, your, your work seems to have a very documentary style of filmmaking. Do you feel that... Um, that genre is supporting your vision as artists and giving you the freedom to be able to um, express your artistic visions and support the thematic um, film? Yeah, I think we just honestly um, got kind of lucky in the symmetry of all of that because the truth is, is like we shot in a documentary way because the whole crew was me and one other dude. Uh, <laughs> So it was just like we had in our hands. It's what we had. It was available materials at the time. Now that being said, we were fans of Cassavetes, and Mark and I, in general, in retrospect, after being interviewed for twelve years, we now realize that like our biggest influences are documentaries and you know events of our own lives and those of our friends and family. Um, you know, because I think we did start off trying to emulate other filmmakers and trying to um, be the Coen brothers for a few years and stuff like that. And we just failed miserably. So it was really just like um, when we started filming ourselves, it was um, just Mark would do things and then I would film them. So it was a, the opposite of how most filmmaking happens. It's like Mark was in charge and I was a documentary filmmaker capturing what he was doing. And then we would conference, of course, like between each take, but it was very much like a collaborative thing. And, you know, our, the, the filmmaking apparatus was so small that just like half the time he'd just be in the world operating and I'd be filming. And if people were like, what's going on? I'll just say it's a documentary. Um, so I, and I, think, I think, you know, the reality is, is that that ethic enhanced what we were doing. You know, we had small stakes white people problems filmmaking uh, and stories at the time, which is just like, you know, that's all we had to offer. You know what I mean? It's just like, we're pathetic and super desperate here. Hopefully you'll laugh at this. Um, and I think the documentary style enhanced it because it made it feel more real. And I think it raised the stakes on something that could have been viewed as paltry, you know, at the time. But I mean, I still love the style because it, um, it, it, it enhances everything about what we like about filmmaking, about putting performances first and allowing actors to rule and, 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 and the world coming first before the cinematic apparatus, like the cinematic apparatus comes second. second. Um, I think it all serves um, in general what we love to do. But like with Room 104, we have all kinds of different styles and we get to play. It's like Room 104 is the film school we, we never really got to fulfill because, you know, but we are we're we're bringing in other people who who are good at these styles and and who are better at it than we are. So we get to play in that world too. Yeah, I remember um, it was like an interview from a very long time ago. But I I remember hearing you guys talking in an interview and talking and professing of your love a for America's funniest home videos, um, and the moment yes. and the moments they produce, and then also that you'll want to make movies for the rest of your life where you see people's faces when they get disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> Funniest videos should be taught in every film school across the world because if you want to learn about exposition and efficient exposition, just watch any of these videos and you know within three seconds there's a there's a wide shot, it's snowing, 
There's a man wearing jeans, no shirt, a Santa Claus hat. And he has a mustache. Very important. <laughs> some lights on a roof, and you hear somebody giggling behind the camera. I mean, what? you could try to write a five-page scene. You're not going to be able to set that up. <laughs> Very educational about how to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. One more from the Uh, hi, guys. I know you said over and over again that your movies are just pulling from personal experiences and using what you had on hand from the beginning. But I'm wondering if after the first few movies, if your idea generation process changed, like if people just came to you with ideas or if you yeah, continued to pull. Yeah, it did. It you did. Know. You know, like there's that whole quote of like, nobody under 30 makes a good piece of art that's not self-referential and indulgent, you know, and, and I, I don't necessarily agree with that. But for us, I think we had to stay very close to home because we weren't um, skilled in any way, shape, or form uh, with the filmmaking form um, and all of the, the complexities of it. And then once we realized, like, oh, we have a little bit of a handle on the form, that allowed us to step outside of ourselves a little bit more and feel like we could tell stories confidently that weren't so close to home. Because you know we can't express enough how fear-based we were at the time because we had failed so many times. And, and I think there's a, a natural fear, and I think it's not a totally unhealthy fear, you know? So now when you look at, you know, a show like Room 104 and there's a, you know, no dialogue modern dance episode or you've got all this, you know, stuff that is very, very far from us, we're feeling a little more confident now with two factors. One, we've been around the form for a while and we know how to tell a story outside of ourselves. And two, if we're not feeling like we're the authorities to do it, we bring in a collaborator who's the best person to do it. So that's allowing us to kind of expand our world of stories. Thank you. Hi, gentlemen. I just have to ask this since uh, Dad funded the film. Obviously, he didn't get the puffy chair. What did Dad get once this movie became uh, kind of popular? <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? So the question was since the Dad didn't get the puffy chair, in fact, as a gift, what did he get after the puffy chair? The movie made you incredibly famous. Yeah. Here's a here's a here's a bit of a dark answer. Um, <laughs> he, I mean, he's incredibly supportive of us uh, throughout the years. So what he what he got um, was the ability to uh, retire early, move to Los Angeles to help us raise our children together. Um, <laughs> And now, because he was a good civil trial attorney with good numbers and skill sets, he's our business manager, and we don't really pay him for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't be too generous. It doesn't really work out. Yes. Um, so, mine's kind of random. I just, as a writer, I'm curious of where certain people get inspiration from. So, is there any random event in life where you kind of got weird inspiration you look back on it and you're just like how the hell did this come out of that um i i think for mark and me both um we we're constantly inspired by people i mean we just like love human beings we just find them fascinating we like to be in airports and watch people and imagine what their lives are like and um, watch their behavior. Um, and the truth is, is like, we're constantly inspired and, um, you know, constantly creating stories, telling stories about people. Oh, did you hear what this dude did? He, can you believe that shit? That's insane and hilarious and adorable and embarrassing. Um, you know, those kinds of stories. And we're constantly just sort of like creating a soup of stories that we live in and are, and are obsessed with. Um, and what we're really, um, I mean, honestly, I think like the lightning strikes more when we find the path or the story arc that like, we call it like the flop when the story just kind of like unfolds in front of you and you're like, that's a movie. Or now if it's like really big, it's like, that's a TV show, you know, like that goes on forever and ever, or that's 90 minutes, you know? Um, that's really, like, we didn't know what that was though to, to, to your point like we would get 
tons of ideas and we would think they were all movies, but only like one out of 50 of them came to fruition because we weren't experienced. Um, so it, it is to your point, it is confusing. Like what is going to be a good movie or where, where do I look for those kinds of things? You know, and, and the advice we just continually try to give people is like, you probably had a conversation over the last six months with someone you're very close with in the wee hours of the morning when you were supposed to be sleeping and it felt like either really embarrassing and you were giggling about it or you were crying about it and it was something deeply personal and felt very specific to you and confessional. Um, and that thing is only belongs to you and only you know what that is and there's your first movie because that's what you have to offer the it's world. You're not a brat. You yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, go find that stuff and bring it out, and then you. I think that's the best place to start. Nice. All right. So let's uh, one more question. We wrap it up. Yeah. Wonderful. My question was if you ever uh, see yourself going back to something that you wrote, perhaps a very long time ago, and and you know. Uh, doing it now with the experience that you have. Have we thought about going, like pulling an old script out of the drawer? Was that the question? Yes, basically. Yeah, it's more of what Mark was saying before where a lot of those ideas that we were trying to make into features, you think they go away forever and then they weirdly find their way into a Room 104 episode or all of a sudden they show up as a subplot throughout a feature and it's like just four or five scenes in the background of a feature that are happening. Um, and I think it's like, um, there's something to that. There's like a richness there because it's like so considered, you know, it was considered potential to be a feature film. So it's, I don't know. It's kind of like that thing where we're always just doing it. We're just constantly obsessing about stories and how to, who, who can we, how can we tell the story? who can show up. And um, I guess it's that thing where it's like, there's nothing else for us really to do in life. But I mean, and, and like you were saying at the beginning, Todd, it's like, we're just doing it our way because we, we want to be happy and not that we are happy because (laughs) we're still fighting that every day too. But you know, it's all about just trying to create a world where we can feel good about what we're doing and, and why we're doing it. I mean, we we feel so lucky that we have money and that we can live in L.A. and live in a house and send our kids to school um, and stuff like that. But I mean, I think one of the unique things are not unique, but just one of the things about Mark and me is that we're kind of like we don't really buy things. <laughs> you know what I mean? We just like. All we've ever wanted to do is like tell stories and have people laugh and cry in movie theaters. And the fact that we're doing that on any level, what, you know, like we're not fixated on theatricals. We're not fixated on this or that. We just like the fact that we can like get enough money to buy food and like still tell stories is like a miracle to me still after all these years. Yeah, I would want to just say one quick thing in, in closing for those of you who are filmmakers. It is, and we preach this all the time and we get a little bit broken recordy, but like it is very hard to get out of your brain the story that you will start as an independent filmmaker and make your way into the studio system and then make a career. And that is one way to do it. But I'm convinced that in the next 30 to 40 years, there's going to be two huge companies left with vertical integration. And they're going to be looking to license libraries from really great creators who have who own all their stuff. So if you start now and you just start making tons of little web series and five and ten thousand dollar movies that even go to moderately sized festivals and you just make your money back on VOD. If you're getting good reviews and you're making good stuff, three, four, five of them will pop. The other forty five might not. But you will be able to take that after you're done without any bosses and license that to one of these two big companies for $10 million and then just retire and do what you want to do. That That is the move right now is build a massive library of stuff um, that you can own the whole way through and then just take and sell it off and just try and make enough to stay alive while you're doing that and you'll be good. Nice, guys. Nice, nice, nice. Um, well, good, yeah, give them applause for that. That was a rousing, a rousing speech. Um, 
Well, thank you guys for all this time. We've gotten you, uh, I think, like an hour in, so I really appreciate it. I also appreciate you guys doing the good guy, bad guy background. So one of you is light and one of you is dark, so everyone will know who the evil one is. Um, Which, or, yeah. and Kim, Kim wants to say hi real quick. Hi, hi buddy! Before we settle out. Um, um, but, uh, but thanks again, you guys. This has really been informative for the students. I know that uh, it's a big deal for them to be able to talk to filmmakers like you who are doing so many things in so many different places. So this is a big deal for us. Uh, it's great for me personally to see you guys tonight. So see you, we'll, we'll see you guys yeah, around bye. soon, all right? Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Take care, guys. Yeah, no. Oh. Yeah.